Welcome back. We're ready for Module 6 of the Series 65 and 66 class presented by Series 7 Specialists. And again, we want to thank you for taking the time to leave us some comments and uh, liking and subscribing to our channel. All of those things are little things that uh, help make this, this new business model possible. And, uh, and we really appreciate you then also looking at our, uh, at our advertisers, clicking on those. Uh, that's, everybody's on the same team. We all want to, to get you over the test. We want you to succeed once you get your license. And so, uh, so let's work together on this. We really, again, appreciate everything that you do to make this new model possible where we can provide these to you at no charge. So let's go ahead and pick back up with where we left off, which was uh, with the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. We're on page 8 of the outline. And uh, the Investment Advisors Act of 1940 is the federal law. Remember we said at the very top of this thing, you've got to segregate out the federal laws from the state laws. And uh, at this time, I'd like to really, really, again, encourage you, find that table in your textbook that contrasts the differences between the federal and the state law. Spend time there. Spend time. Don't spend it. Invest time there. All right? That's valuable, valuable time for you. Uh, I, I Honestly, I cannot emphasize that too much. So just, uh, like I say, it's a great summary. I, I'm, I don't care which publisher it is. If they've got the summary, it's going to be very valuable information for you. So let's go ahead and look, and we start looking at definitions on these things because the definitions, the terminology, are so important. Uh, the Investment Advisors Act 1940 defines a broker as a company that... Um, that affects transactions on behalf of others as an agent, uh, as an agent. Uh, in fact, what you need to think of here, if you're having problems keeping a broker and a dealer separate, just throw away securities altogether. Think in terms of, of folks that we deal with. Like, for instance, you've done business with a real estate broker before, and they employ agents who help to, to sell properties. When I sell my house through a real estate broker, the broker doesn't buy it, the agent doesn't buy it themselves. Rather, what they do is that they go out and they find a buyer for me. And they match up, or, or it's Mary, that, uh, that, that seller and that buyer together so that we can do a transaction. That's what brokers do, is that uh, brokering a deal. We don't take, uh, we don't take title, we, don't, uh, uh, we never own the stuff. We just find the buyer and the seller, we match it up. And right there on the first page of that real estate contract, what does it say? It says that you agree to pay the broker a commission of X percent. Brokers get commissions because they're not participating in the trade in any way. They have to, have, have to be paid differently, it's by a commission. A dealer, on the other hand, think about an automobile dealer. And what do they do? They say that in order to get the rebate, you must take delivery from dealer inventory. You get certain uh, allowances on those things that are in stock the longest, some of the things that you may hear. Uh, you know, that when, they, uh, when it comes time for you to trade in your car, they say, oh, we're going to have to send it to the, the wholesale, to the auction. They always say that, you know. Uh, why? Because if they're going to buy it themselves, they can do whatever they darn well please with it. And what do they do? Sometimes, sometimes they'll actually buy it from you. They'll clean it up, spruce it up, polish it up, mark it up, and sell it then at retail. You've seen the, the blue book, all right, the native books, where you have the, the average wholesale and the average retail. That difference between the two, that markup, that's what security dealers do, is that they will buy, holding their own inventory, take the risk of ownership that's for their own account and risk and they will charge a markup or a markdown uh, where they, they mark down a security that they're buying from someone else. So uh, basically that's a, a broker-dealer is a business that, uh, that uh, has both functions, that of a broker and as a dealer, but not on the same trade. You're one or the other on any particular trade. A person's a very broad definition which includes natural and non-natural persons. I've got a couple of, uh, a couple of questions I like to ask. Uh, it, it, can I open an account for it, whatever it may be? Or, or could, could it enter into a contract, whatever it may be? If the answer is yes, then that's a person. So that's going to include not only folks, but also it's going to include 
governmental agencies, broker dealers, it's going to include uh, uh, trusts, it's going to include uh, uh, corporations, LLCs, partnerships, uh, it, it, any of those. I can open an account with it or it can enter into a contract. Therefore, it's a person. About the only things that are not persons would be incompetent folk and minors, dead guys. That's about it. I mean, a dead guy can't enter into a contract, all right? Incompetent people cannot, minors cannot, and so therefore they are not considered to be persons. But that's about it. That's about, other than that, that's it. It's very important to take that broad view of the term person um, when you look at, uh, at the questions. A non-person, there they are. Dead guys, incompetents, and minors. That's about it. Uh, an investment advisor. So what is an investment advisor according to the act? It's any person who, for compensation, they have compensation or else it's, it's just a hobby. They're engaging in the business of advising others as to value of securities. All right, so it's, it has to be, it's what they do. And so they do it on a regular basis. It's some, there's a pattern where they get paid for this. That's their business. You can tell that it's, it's an ongoing business. And it's on securities. If I were to, to uh, issue my opinion on, uh, on the value of fixed life insurance policies, fixed annuities, I would not be considered an investment advisor because even though I got paid for it, even though it's what I do all day long, that's not concerning securities. Okay? Gold bullion wouldn't be a security. And so I would not be considered an investment advisor. Or, as a part of a regular business, again, they'll issue reports, analyses or reports concerning securities. So if I have a, a, a market newsletter or something like that, then that would put me into the situation where I could be considered an investment advisor. And the definition specifically includes pension advisors. Okay? These are folks who, instead of dealing with the individual folks who are participants in the pension plan, they deal with the administrators of the plan and they say, look, in order to fulfill your fiduciary responsibility and offer your folks real good performance, you should select this fund, that fund, some other fund. Uh, things have changed. We've had management at fund four. We need to, to drop it and roll everybody into this new fund that will do a better job because they have better management. Something like that, okay? They may not deal with individual people, but they, they are, in fact, dealing with the pension funds and therefore pension advisors are specifically included. Also specifically included uh, would be, um, uh, would be uh, advisors to sports figures or other celebrities. And this is according to SEC release IA 1092, which defines out certain particular types. One other thing about uh, IA 92 is, uh, is that it, it talks about if you're in the business, and that's one of the, the criteria, criteria for being de determined to be an investment advisor is that you're in the business. If I hold myself out as being an investment advisor, then what have I done? I've established a business. Now, I may not have any customers yet, but I've established my business. That's what I do, is that I offer advice on securities for a fee. All of a sudden, if I say that I am one, I am one. And so holding yourself out to be an investment advisor qualifies you as an investment advisor in the eyes of the law, not necessarily in terms of the job you're going to do, but in the eyes of the law, you are an investment advisor. An investment advisor representative. The investment advisor is the business. The investment advisor representative is the flesh and blood individual. Check it. Does it have a pulse? If so, then it's not an investment advisor. It's an advice, investment advisor representative. Even if I have a one-man shop, I become my own investment advisor's representative. All right, so a representative is the flesh and blood individual associated with an advisor who performs non-clerical functions. If all that I do is answer the phone and, and file files and do type what I no, no, no. That's not an investment advisor representative. But if I have any, any type of, of direct or indirect participation in those advisory activities, then I am, in fact, an investment advisor representative. Investment advisory representatives must register with state administrators. Now, I like to talk about this now because what we're going to find is that, that there's a roster for the businesses. 
at both the federal government and the state level. However, the federal government has no roster whatsoever for individuals. So they have to, to register someplace. They have to register with the state administrator, and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail when we talk about the Uniform Securities Act. All right, exclusions and exemptions. And we've talked about these uh, just a little bit when we were talking about exempt securities and exempt transactions. Okay, exclusions, you, you'll need to know the difference between the two because sometimes you'll get to a question and it, you'll get down to two and you'll just swear that both of them are right. To a degree they are because neither one is included in whatever the question is talking about. But why? Mine back up through the question. Again, see what it is that, uh, that we're looking for because that question is your friend. It could be that it has the word exclusion or exemption. Let's talk about the difference between the two. What we're going to do is that we're going to have a critical discussion of apples. So what we do is we take a table, we put various and sundry types of apples on there, and we look it over and say, okay, uh, wait, whoa, whoa, time out just a second. What's that? That's an orange. That's not an apple. I mean, that doesn't even meet the criteria of an apple. It's a citrus fruit, for crying out loud. You know, it, it doesn't have the, 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 the skin, the, you, you bite into the skin of the orange, man, you're in for a surprise. You know, it, it's just, it's just not an apple. Let's, let's exclude it altogether from our critical discussion. Because the thing is that oranges just don't meet the criteria. They don't meet the standards to even be called an apple in the first place. So, you're right. So we take the apple off the table. It's now out of our consideration. Now we have a table that has nothing but apples. One guy says, you know, when I was growing up, my grandma had a wine sap apple tree. And, you know, I am just really, really attached to wine sap apples. Because every time, that, every time I see one, every time I taste one, I think back to my grandma. And God rest her soul, I miss her so much. And, you know, if we get to talking too critically about a wine sap, I might just lose it. Well, this guy has kind of a reputation of starting bar fights for crying out loud. And so we think, you know, maybe we ought to listen to him. So he said, uh, you know, I move that we exempt wine saps from our, con from our discussion. And uh, somebody else says, yeah, I second that. And he was, okay, all in favor? Yeah. And we all do that. So what we do is we grab that wine sap apple. We take it off the table, out of our consideration. It's an apple for crying out loud. There's no doubt about it. It is an apple. However, by specific rule, by specific determination, we have decided that it's not going to be considered because it is exempt from our consideration. Now, a delicious apple of Granny Smith, the Pink Lady, yeah, you know, they're, they're in there, all right? But the wine sap, we have specifically exempted, like I say, by rule or by other decision. No doubt about it that it's, it's, you know, it's an apple, but it's exempted. And those, that's the difference between the two. Okay. The exclusions just don't meet the criteria. The exemption, we've decided that even though it meets the criteria, there's some other extenuating circumstance. So exclusion from the definition of broker-dealers. Uh, start out, oh, surprise, surprise, banks. Trust company, and something that sounds like a bank, call it a bank for this test. You can argue with it, you can nitpick on it, it's of no, of no value. Just if it is a bank or sounds like a bank, then it's going to be excluded from the definition of investment advisor. And the next you have the, what's called the LATE acronym. Lawyers, accountants, teachers, and engineers. Those are specifically excluded from the definition. They don't meet the criteria of an investment advisor, assuming that the investment advice they give is part of their legal practice, their accounting practice, their teaching, or their engineering work. Okay, so basically here's the deal. I'm looking at investing in a real estate partnership, the local real estate properties, and uh, they're just going to turn some of these things around, do some renovations, etc. And uh, my buddy is a, uh, is a structural engineer. And I say, you know, the way I, I probably ought to have you look at some of these properties. And he said, not a bad idea because, you know, if they're, if they're all you know, 
have foundations that have failed, you're going to just chew up so much money that you can't make any money on it. So I tell you about do an engineering report for me. And so he comes back with an engineering report and he says, let's, let's say that there were problems. He says, Dan, out of those eight properties, seven of them have serious, serious structural flaws. Uh, it's going to take so much money. It's just, stay away from that. What did he just do? He gave me advice on security. Right? Yeah, he said, stay away from it. Don't invest in it. That's advice. And my partnership is a security. So he gave me advice on securities. And then he hands me a bill. And what does the bill say? The bill says, for structural evaluation and preparation of a structural report, I owe him this much money. What's he doing? He's doing engineering work. That's what he's doing. And oh, by the way, the conclusion of his engineering work is, you don't want to go there. Now, let's change things very slightly, okay? What if he had said, you know, I've got my engineering report, and there it is, and there's the bill for my engineering report. I look at it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What does all this mean? He says, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what it means if you give me an extra $100. Uh-oh, what's he doing? Now he's got some separate billing. Okay. And that separate billing for the investment advisory services, that could put him into a category, that will put him into a category where he is, um, uh, where he, he becomes an investment advisor. Or let's look at his Yellow Pages ad, okay, or his, his, his ads that he has, his business cards, whatever. He has Joe Blow, structural engineer, great structural engineering work. There you go, he's an engineer. Any investment advice he gives is going to be incidental to his, all factors equal, it's going to be incidental to his engineering work. But what if his engineering, or if his business card says, reliable structural engineering work, we specialize in advising on whether or not to invest in real estate programs, specifically syndicated real estate programs, which are securities. Uh-oh, now what's he doing? He's holding himself out as being an investment advisor. John Jones, accurate, dependable, timely accounting work, and a pretty good investment advisor, too. They just walked out from underneath their umbrella of exclusion by holding themselves out as investment advisors. That puts them into that business. All right? And then, believe it or not, the next exclusion, broker-dealers, it's actually the same type situation that you have with lawyers, accountants, teachers, and engineers. Because broker-dealers and representatives, the agents at the state level they'll be called, they give advice on investments every day of the week. I mean, that's what they do. You need to buy this bond. You need to sell that stock. Okay, It's part of the job. But how are they compensated? They're compensated by the commissions that they generate, the markups, markdowns that they generated when they're acting as dealers. That investment advice is incidental to their generation of commissions. And so therefore, it's the same type exclusion. Now, just like the engineer, the lawyer, accountant, teacher, they all can step out from underneath their umbrella of exclusion, so the broker-dealer can step out from under its umbrella of exclusion by charging for financial plans, by having what they call wrap accounts, where it's a fee-based account. Look at, look, at what, um, look at what you've got with a regular account. Okay? The primary income for the, uh, for the, from the account is going to be commissions, whereas the, 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 the investment advice that the broker-dealer gives is just incidental. If you have a wrap account and you charge an asset-based fee, then what you're looking at is the primary way of making money, no longer commissions. We'll give away the doggone trades. We don't care about that anymore. What we care about is managing this pool of money. Now, the investment advice on this is primary, and the transactions are secondary. So it's exactly the same thing. They can both st step out, all step out from underneath their umbrella of exclusion by making it their business to give investment advice. All right, so anyway, but uh, the broker-dealers 
can do that. Uh, asset management fees, like I say, they negate that exclusion. General circulation newspapers, magazines, or other publications. When it's a bona fide general purpose publication. But we've got an article in there every Tuesday about the condition of the stock market. Y'all, yeah, that's fine. What do you have on Monday and Wednesday and the other days? You've got the news coming out of the Middle East. You've got the news coming out of Washington, D.C. It's a bona fide publica newspaper publication. News is a publication that, oh, by the way, you know, it's a general interest. Part of general interest is what do I do with my money? All right. So, uh, so in any event, those uh, those magazines, other publications that are that are bona fide general circulation, not uh, a, a, an investment newsletter where we target. Are you concerned with your investments? Then you need to subscribe to our news. You know, Anyway, but if the investment advisor's business is, is restricted to treasury securities, then there's an exclusion at the federal level. I'll tell you what, here's a little reminder for this one, and then we're coming up on a, a point where we'll need to take a break, so we'll break after this. Real quick reminder, all right? If all I give advice on is federal securities like treasuries, then I have a federal exclusion. I don't see the word state up there anywhere. All right. Under state law, I'm included in the definition. I may have to register because there may or may not be another exemption for me. Okay? Because these federal securities, these treasury securities, they may be exempt securities, but they're securities nonetheless. And so, but I've, I've got, to, if all I give advice on is those federal securities treasuries, then I have a federal only exemption. So I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and wrap up this module. We'll come back then in a few minutes and pick up the next module. And I uh, hope you're enjoying it. Uh, again, be sure to uh, visit our advertisers, like us, subscribe to us. And, uh, and, and we do appreciate the comments you have. And mostly tell them, folks. Okay, that helps us more than anything. Thanks again. We'll see you in a little bit.